Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron. And today I'd like to do an example modeling multi-degree of freedom systems. And this is for fundamentals of mechanical vibrations. So here's the problem. I've got two masses. Block one is attached to the wall with a spring of stiffness k. And then the second mass is attached to that with an identical spring and they both have identical masses. So again, we'd like to find the equations of motion for this system. And as we've talked about in class, our modeling strategy starts off by kind of thinking about the problem and the motion and identifying the forces. Then we'll turn to coordinates and directions. After that, kinematics. So we'll describe the acceleration and the motion of each mass followed by free body diagrams to identify the forces and to define those. Finally, we'll apply the equations of motion and laws of mechanics to, to come up with the resulting model for the behavior. So if I look at this system, it has two degrees of freedom. Right? So it's a two degree of freedom system. The easiest way to think about that is determine how many coordinates you need in order to specify where everything's at. So if I look at block one, I could use one coordinate to basically tell me where that block is. Right? So maybe it's the displacement with respect to the wall. But if I know that one coordinate, the system's not fixed because the second mass can still move around. So then I would need a second coordinate to determine the, dis well, the location of this second mass. It could be a lot of different things. It could be the position of this mass with respect to the wall. It could be the relative position with respect to mass one. But the point is I need two measurements in order to specify where the system is at. And therefore, it's a two degree of freedom system. So now, if I want to think about the motion, or if I want to think about the objects, I have two objects, right? So I'll represent them as block one. Right, so here, and then we have block two over here. And then let's identify the forces that act on each of these masses. So for block one, I've got a force from the spring on the left and on the right. right? So the left and the right. And then for block two, it has a force on the left, again, from this spring uh, connecting the two objects. So I'll just kind of define those. And this one will be F1. And this force will be F2. And notice that because these forces are internal, then the magnitudes are equal and the directions are opposite. So we'll write this force as minus F2 acting on the second block. So again, F1 is spring 1 between the wall and block 1. And then F2 represents the force in spring 2 between the two masses. So now let's define coordinates and directions that will define the configuration. Directions are relatively easy. We'll define i and j like so, uh, horizontal and vertical. So now what coordinates do we need? Well, we can define the displacement of block 1, right? We'll call that y, with respect to, say, the unstretched position of the spring. And likewise, we can define the displacement of block 2 as x, again, relative to the unstretched position of, of this system. But then we also might need a coordinate that describes the stretch in this spring. Because after all, the force in this spring is going to be related to the stretch. Right? So we'll define that as z. So now, again, this is a two degree of freedom system, and we have three coordinates. Right? So again, two degrees of freedom. But we defined three coordinates. So that means that there's a relationship between these three, right? Because only two of them are independent. And, and obviously here, if I look, I can ask, what's the displacement of the block on the right? Well, that's x. 
and that's going to be the displacement of the block on the left, so y, plus the relative displacement between these two. Right, so y plus z would be a coordinate relationship, right, or what we call a constraint between the coordinates. So now, in terms of kinematics, we need to identify the acceleration of both blocks. We defined x and y so that they represented the absolute displacements of these two blocks with respect to the ground. So it makes sense to use those to define the acceleration. Right? So in particular, the acceleration of block 1, right? so this is 1, and this will be 2, is y double dot in the i direction, and the acceleration of block 2 is x double dot in the i direction. Now that we've finished the kinematics, we need to turn to the kinetics, or the forces, that act on these blocks. Right, so remember from the previous slide, this was minus F2, and this is plus F2. Again, these are of equal magnitude, opposite direction. And then this was force 1. So these forces that act on these blocks are defined in terms of constitutive relations for the springs themselves. Okay, so these are just spring laws. Right, so looking at this force, it will depend on this stiffness k and this coordinate y. Right, so in particular, f1 here, if y is positive, this force is going to be in the minus i direction. Now, looking at force F2, it actually depends on the stretch in s the second spring, which we defined as Z. So here, F2 is equal to plus K times Z in the I direction. So that as a result, this force, well, it's just minus KY in the I direction. This force is KZ in the i direction. And then this force, because it's the negative of F2, is minus kz in the i direction. All right, so we've done coordinates and the kinematics. And now we have a free body diagram. So all that's left to do is apply the equations of motion. Right. So on each block, we apply momentum balance. Namely, some of the forces equals mass times the acceleration of the block. So for block one, let's go back and look at the forces. Block one has the force on the left, force on the right, right? So it's minus k times y in the i direction plus k times z in the i direction equals the mass times the acceleration, which was y double dot in the i direction. And likewise, on block 2, let's go back and look. We just had the force on the left. So we have minus k times z in the i direction is equal to m times the acceleration. Well, here the acceleration is in terms of this coordinate, which measures the absolute displacement of block 2. So that's x double dot in the i direction. So now I can combine these two equations. And I see that minus k times y plus k times z equals my double dot. And minus k times z equals mx double dot. If you look, I have two equations here. But I actually have three coordinates, because I have x, y, and z. Well, remember, I actually have a third equation that represents the constraint. 
right? So that constraint equation was x is equal to y plus z. So now I can use these three equations and eliminate one of the variables, right? So I'll choose x and y. Right, so in particular, z here is equal to x minus y. And the resulting set of equations can be written as mx double dot plus k times z. Well, z was x minus y equals 0. That's this equation. And then my double dot plus k times y minus k times z. So that's x minus y equals 0. So notice that I can combine these two. Right? I have two equations here. I have two coordinates. I can actually write this in matrix form. So I have a matrix times a vector. The first vector will be x double dot, y double dot. So if you look at this first equation, it's m times x double dot. And then there's no y double dot. And then I also have another matrix times the vector x and y. And this is going to be equal to 0. This second piece is, well, k times x. And then minus k times y. Looking at the second equation, I get basically 0 times x double dot plus m times y double dot. And then for the x piece, I have minus k to x. That's minus k. And then the y, I actually have two of those. So I have 2k times y. So essentially, this, I don't like that. So essentially, this equation ends up being the first row here. And then this equation gives me the second row. I can take these two equations again and write them in matrix form, which, as we'll see later, will actually be very useful. So here they are again. These are the equations. This is the matrix form. I can actually represent this in shorthand, right? So let's define the vector x as the coordinates x and y, right? So in particular, x double dot, and again, this is a vector, not to be confused with the scalar quantity x double dot and y double dot. So if I do that, then this set of equations can be written as a matrix M times x double dot plus a matrix K times x equals 0. This matrix M, which again in this case is M, 0, 0, M, is known as the mass matrix. If you think about a single degree of freedom system, right, looks very similar, right? This is kind of the mass times acceleration plus stiffness times displacement equals z, or equals zero. So in this case, k, you can imagine, will be the stiffness matrix. And it's k minus k on the diagonal or the off diagonals. 2k there. Now, I just want to point out one thing here. Well, two things, actually. The mass matrix is diagonal. So that means that the components off the diagonal are 0. Now, if you look at that, what that means is, or what that implies, is that this y double dot term doesn't influence the first equation. Likewise, x double dot doesn't influence the second equation. Right? So 
in terms of this, x double dot and y double dot are decoupled, right? So if m is diagonal, then those terms, those acceleration terms, are decoupled. And, and we would say that the system is dynamically uncoupled. Now contrast that with the stiffness matrix. So here I have non-zero terms in these off-diagonal components. So that implies that the y coordinate influences this first equation. We'll call that the x equation. Right? So the y coordinate influences the x equation. And likewise the x coordinate couples into the y equation or the second equation here. Right? So because k is not diagonal, then we would say that this system is statically un or statically coupled. And you can imagine a case where the mass matrix was not diagonal and then it would be dynamically coupled or you could imagine a situation where the stiffness matrix was diagonal and then the system would be statically uncoupled. Right, so this idea of coupling is very different than a single degree of freedom system where there's just one coordinate, just one equation, none of this is even a consideration. But now with multi degree of freedom systems, things become more complicated. Right? One coordinate can be wrapped up into multiple equations and it makes solving these a little more difficult. But we'll see how to do that later. So that's it for this example. Um, Hope you enjoyed it, and I will talk to you later. Thanks. Bye.